Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of From a Woman to a Leader. And today, I'm super excited to have here with me Julissa Hermosen. And Julissa is a trailblazing leader in the tech industry. She has impressive careers, spanning roles at Microsoft, Salesforce, and now she is a speaker, author, and business strategy consultant. And we're going to talk about a topic that is so important and not talked enough about. We're going to talk about the wealth gap and especially for Latina leaders. Hi, Julissa, and welcome. Thank you so much, Lamar. I'm so honored to be on your podcast. And uh, I think this is an important conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. It is very important. And I'm so excited. So let's maybe start a little bit with you and your background. And you mentioned in our pre-call that you kind of call yourself Cafe con Leche Latina. Yes. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am Dominican. Uh, I am an immigrant. I was born in my country. And uh, like many immigrants, you know, came, my family came to this country. And uh, so uh, Dominicans are, many of them are mixed race, right? So we are European, the Spaniard, you know, size, Spaniard, Portuguese, African, uh, mostly West African and indigenous. My, my mix also has, you know, Middle Eastern and uh, ancestry and, and, and so many others. So uh, I consider myself cafe con leche, Latina, uh, brown Latina, um, you know, just to honor the diversity of, of my racial and ethnic makeup. So, so that's, yeah, that's what I call myself. Uh, in terms of my career, um, I've, I started my career in, uh, at a tech startup, actually. Uh, it was a minority owned tech startup in New Jersey. And I was the 45th employee and I was their first salesperson, their first sales director, and then their first sales and marketing director. And I uh, was responsible for the Microsoft partnership. And so from there, I was recruited into Microsoft and spent almost 14 years there. And um, I started in sales um, and really uh, moved my career into partner uh, management. And then I started working in our ISV organization, helping our ISV partners develop their solutions and their technologies for our mutual customers. And I really loved that, um, that area of the business. And so then from there, I worked in uh, Microsoft Learning Experiences. And so that organization was responsible for um, education technology. And so what I did uh, as my role as a worldwide business development manager, um, I was responsible for Latin America, um, the Eastern Seaboard and, um, and Canada and did some work um, in EMEA and APAC as well. And so what we did was large scale technology implementations um, and partnerships with um, with governments and ministries of education um, all over the world. The way that I saw my career at Microsoft was really uh, deliberate, frankly. Um, I, you know, I wanted a career that went local. So I worked in the New York, New Jersey uh, district, then national with the ISB practice and worked with uh, partners across the US and then global working in Microsoft learning experiences. So when my last role at Microsoft, I knew would be my last role. Um, and so, because I sort of achieved that goal, right? And then I moved, um, was recruited to Salesforce and worked in their .org organization. And there I helped, um, you know, global strategic um, nonprofit um, organizations transform the digital you know, footprint and transformation. And then from there, I started my own um, college and career consulting business and took a little bit of a career break, you know, just to kind of, um, I had a, a family member who was ill at the time, but I still wanted to, um, you know, work and help others. So I, I did a bit of coaching 
then when I went back into the workforce, I worked for a smaller organization. When my when I say smaller, it was a high growth, you know, 250 million organization. So to me, that was uh, smaller and helped um, led their strategic alliances. So I worked um, with and, and led the partnerships with Microsoft globally, Facebook, Google, Indeed. And it was a different area of a business, a tech business that I um, did because it was in the HR and HCM space. So the thing that's fantastic about tech is, you know, you can really, um, you can really sort of grow your career in different areas of the business and learn along the way. That's critically important to me. And then from there, after I, I did that for a number of years, I was recruited back into Salesforce mm -hmm. and then worked in their alliances and channels uh, organization and partner strategy and operations and led their uh, partner enablement for their 2000 SI partners in North America. So, and then now, you know, I'm writing a book, I'm doing strategy and consulting and speaking. And so it's been, a, it's been quite a ride. Yeah, it has. And uh, such an impressive career. And I want to congratulate you on taking a very, you know, bold move to live a very, very successful career and yeah. start your own venture. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it, it is. And it's something that I'm seeing a lot of um, people who've had, you know, long careers uh, do as well. And and um, it's been, it's, it's definitely not easy. It's, it's a challenge to grow a business as, as you know, but it's absolutely rewarding. Yes, I can relate to that. It's rewarding. And uh, I think probably we both felt that that was the right timing for us to do that. Yes, yes. You know, um, and we're going to talk about money and generational wealth and the wealth gap and all that. Uh, I, I definitely had a number in mind, you know, when I thought about, uh, when I will leave, you know, corporate full time. Right. And so, um, I think that's the strategic lens, right. When you think about your career, like when is it, when is it time to say, Hey, I'm going to do my own thing and, uh, lead that, you know, day to day but also provide value because of the experiences that you've had, because that's important too. Absolutely. And you mentioned like you see yourself as a brown Latina. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, how did it feel? Have you ever felt, I don't know, in any way isolated or yeah. underrepresented in the corporate world? Yeah. So, you know, you know, it's interesting because when I first started, you know, in tech, uh, you know, as a young woman in, in her 20s, and even, even actually throughout my career, there were many instances where I was either the only woman. Uh, it, I, I say it's the start of the onlys, right? The beginning of the onlys. You're the only woman. You're the only woman woman of color, or you're the only person of color, and you're, you're the only immigrant. And so uh, what that what that does, it's interesting, because, you know, I was raised in the US, educated in the US. And so it, it, there's sort of this duality, you know, you're, you're not from here, and you're not from there. There's a saying in Spanish, no, so no, so de aquí, no, so de allá. You're not from here, you're not from there, like, where do you belong, right? And so um, there were many instances of, of feeling that uh, in, in, you know, growing up in, in Korea. And I think that's quite common for people who are, you know, immigrants or people who are just different in, in some ways. It's very common. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's been many of that. And it's funny because I don't necessarily think of myself like when I'm walking into a meeting or walking into a room as you know a brown woman or a Dominican. I don't. I just think, hey, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here to get something done. I'm here to you know negotiate. I mean, I'm walking in as my business self. 
And then when other people sort of address you or bring it up, that's when you're like, gosh, I'm seen as different. And so that's, that could be a bit, you know, jarring, but we've got to navigate that because it's just the way it is, right? Because there's just not enough Latinas and not enough Latina leaders in, in the tech industry, right? And so, you know, if you think about, this is a, a really jarring, you know, statistics of the 63 million Hispanics and Latinos in the U.S., only 7% of Latinx talent work in tech. 7%. And of that 7%, 4% are in leadership roles. And then when you take that, 2% are women in leadership roles. So it's like you're a fraction of a fraction of a percentage point. There's just not enough to, to really, you know, to have a, uh, to, there's just not enough. So it's, yeah, solving for that is. It's not enough. And I think one of the challenges are that because there is not enough, maybe others don't feel that it's something that is possible for them. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Yes. And there is there is that. And I also think that, you know, you know for me in, in my career, um, you know, there's been that feeling of isolation, but that's when you need to really find, you know, the people that will support your career. And they may not always look like you. It is a benefit when someone looks like you. It just is, right? Because then you've got sort of like you're watching that leader and what they're doing and, and who they're like. But the, the truth is that I was, I've been able to benefit from people who've been my allies that see me and the value that I bring to the organization and invest in me. And many of those people, particularly in the beginning of my career, did not look like me at all, right? And so I think um, there is that challenge. There is a challenge of allyship, right? Um, and if we can solve for that and, and, and garner more mentorship, sponsorship, all of those things, right, help you build and grow in your career. I would not have been able to grow in my career without, you know, a sponsor in particular. Uh, so, so all those things is just, yeah, because it becomes a, a challenge. Yeah. And sure. I can relate to what you're saying. Uh, actually, the biggest supporters in my career were white men. Yes. The, the people who pushed me, who has supported me the most which is super important, but we're not going to talk specifically about that. I wanted to ask you about a very, very interesting statistics that you sh shared with me about Latinas and their kind of um, business ownership. How, how many of them are starting a business? What's interesting about money, right, is... Um we're not necessarily comfortable talking about it, right? And what I have seen both anecdotally and in, in the data is women, Latina women are the fastest growing demographic of people who are starting businesses. And I wonder why, right? I, I wonder why. And I think part of it just anecdotally is, hey, I've tried the traditional method. I've tried the traditional path. I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to promote myself. I'm going to grow a business, whether it's a tech, but, you know, even, you know, I'm, I'm part of an organization that um, invests in Latin owned businesses. And the majority are startup tech businesses. And the majority of those are founded by women. And it's very interesting because this is what we're seeing, right? There's there's many paths to building wealth and generational wealth. And I think Latinas are saying, hey, I'm not going to rely on the traditional path, path that when I was growing up maybe was, you know, challenging, right? And, you know, they're starting also, um, you know, jobs as influencers and social media uh, presence and their own businesses. So there's more ways than one, right? For, for Latinas to grow 
in in their wealth. So it's it's just an interesting um interesting thing that we're seeing. And Latinas are just taking the reins and say, hey, I'm gonna build something for myself. Yeah, this is very interesting. And you mentioned a lot also generational gap. Can you share a little bit your perspective about that, about closing the generation gap in Latinas? Yes. Can can we just pause for a second? I just yeah. want to look at some notes. Yeah. So, and... and let's talk about, uh, go back to your experiences. Can you share any instances where, you know, your identity may have influenced your professional experiences, either positively or negatively. Yeah. So I think it's, what's interesting about um, the Latinx culture, right? Um, if you're raised by traditional, you know, parents, I was raised by very traditional, you know, Dominican parents, you know, the work ethic is extremely strong. And also the the language around work that you know we're raised in, and it's very common in many Latin American countries, is work hard, be humble, keep your head down, and you will be rewarded. Other people will notice your and reward you. That does not necessarily serve us well in tech or in any corporate you know landscape when you're navigating your career so we've got to really think about you know how do we honor our our heritage but also understand that that there are there are lessons that we've been we've been taught that that we've got to sort of shift around um really speaking up about money pay promotions and and all of that if we really want to grow not just grow in our career but build the wealth that we want to build because the thing that's really interesting and one of like the best advice is that advice that um a mentor gave me and this this mentor was really interesting he is completely different from me right you know i am a five three brown Dominican, Latina, immigrant. He's like a six, five, you know, white male. Uh, you know, I'm a Christian and, and you know, and he's, you know, another, another religion, completely different. And that's why I chose him. I chose him because I thought he is different from me, CRO, and he gave me one of the best pieces of advice. And the advice was actually, what where do you want to like where do you want to end your career making what kind of money and i thought this is the first time ever someone's having a mentorship conversation that's really a financial conversation it's never happened before and i just appreciate that because that culture that's co counterculture right that's and so we're like we're like busting all of those narratives and all of those all of those things that we've grown up with. There's another saying in our culture, you know, for women, calladita es eres más bonita. And what that means is when you're quiet, you're prettier. So that keeps us silent in so many ways. For me, I am, I'm just really impressed with the younger generation of Latinas that I'm seeing and that I follow and that I even learn from because, they're taking that narrative and they're saying, no, you know, I'm starting my own business. I'm starting my own podcast. I am, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing me. They're doing themselves and they're taking those narratives and they want, they're, you know, I talk to them because I mentor them. I learn from them, but I also mentor them and they're trying to navigate like those two worlds. And, you know, it's, it's challenging uh, because we want to honor our roots, right? We want to honor our heritage, but we also know it doesn't like, you know, we're in 2024 in the US. It's it's a different, it's different here. So. Absolutely. And uh, I would say that uh, in general, not just Latina, Latinas, women in general 
that's kind of the norms. Be pretty, be quiet. Don't talk about money. Money is not something we talk about. I think in general, in 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 families that uh, maybe traditional kind of middle class, money is not something you talk about. Money is evil. So there are a lot of those preconceptions about money that you're not supposed to, and what you said, like doing a good job and someone will notice you. I grew up that that as well. I'm not Latina. So I think it kind of, it it is very common for women in general yes. that we feel uncomfortable kind of advocating for ourselves, asking for something, asking for money is even a taboo. I mean, we don't want to talk about money. What's really interesting about asking for money is, you know, all the mentoring conversations that I have with, you know, mostly, you know, Latinos, you know, Latinas and and Latinos is around money, like negotiating a package. How do I ask for more? You know, um, negotiating a promotion with a boss. It is all around money, but it's sort of like, I need help. You know, it's very, you know, <laughs> it's very secretive. And, you know, I've gotten, you know, comments like, but if, what if they take away the offer? What if they, you know, withdraw the offer if I ask for more, right? And so there's, there's fear behind it, but if we don't ask for it, I mean, if we don't ask for it, we, we just, we will never, we will never get it. What I tell them is, Listen, we are already at a disadvantage, right? Women or male, brown, Hispanic, and think about the Latina wealth, um, pay gap. For every dollar a non-Hispanic white male earns, Latinas earn 57 cents on that dollar. So when you go in to negotiate, understand that the range that they're giving you or the package that they're giving you, it could be very well below a package that they would offer. So go in and negotiate and ask for that thinking that mindset, not that, you know, you're asking for more, you're asking for equal, right? That's the goal, right? That's, that's the goal. So that helps. I think it helps me kind of have more, um, more uh, confidence, right? When I ask, the other thing that I think, um, and I I learned this through an executive coach of mine, um, is to think of negotiation as just a game, right? It's just a game. It's not personal. It's it's actually have some fun with it. And so I started doing that. Like, you know, even recently, you know, my, you know, this was um, uh, last, last summer, my air conditioner broke and I negotiated. I was like, okay, you know, I haven't done this in a while. Let's negotiate. Let's have some fun with it. I won't go into all the stories, but it was like three companies. It started from $8,000 quote and I negotiated down to $250 with three companies. And so I just was, I started, I was stressed out about it. Obviously like the air conditioner is not working in the house in the summer, but I, I put on the negotiate, let's have fun with this negotiation process and not fear, right. But enjoy it, enjoy that process. So, um, yeah, so. (laughs) That's a great tip. And I think that uh, negotiation in general, is a muscle. It is a muscle to be trained. Agreed. Yes. And yeah. uh, I heard, I think, a YouTube of someone, I don't recall her name, but she said she went to department stores and she tried to negotiate like a price of a shirt or whatever, like in Macy's or something. And yes, you don't expect them to actually give you a discount, but she actually said it once they even... Uh, try to kind of come forward to her and try to make some arrangement. But it's not about getting the discount. It's about training that muscle. Yes, I agree. I just negotiated with the dry cleaners yesterday. <laughs> you know, like it is just like, just, just enjoy it. It is a muscle. And 
I think the more we do that, the the less afraid and intimidated we are. You know, we understand the data around, you know, I mean, we have a whole day, Latina equal pay day, to, to bring awareness of the pay inequity, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know. Yeah, one last thing I want to say about that is to the employers, don't take advantage. Don't take advantage, not Latinas, not Black, not any person, then don't ask for what they deserve. Give them what they deserve, you know, regardless. If they ask less, give them what they should get. I agree. And I would also say to... Um, I, I would also say, you know, if it's if you if you won't do that, right? Don't be surprised when your people leave. Just don't. Yeah. Don't be surprised. I remember um I I was in a role and I was I was killing it. Right? I was achieving, I was getting recognition at the company level. My name, you know, um uh, you know, at the, at the highest level, at the C-suite level, my name, you know, shared at, you know, all hands, all this. And then when it came time for performance review, I did not get what I thought I deserved. So, you know, I was like, mm -mm, no, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. And so I promoted myself. I didn't get the promotion that I wanted. And that's fine because, you know, it's, listen, it's competitive, right? But I said, I'm going to promote myself. And I did. And so, and I earned more, higher pay, higher level, et cetera. So you've got to really sort of balance that, right? If you're, if, if you're not going to pay, you know, you know, equity, it, um, um, what's the word? Um, equitable, equitable, then you know, pe your people will leave and, but don't be surprised that they do. Yes. And this is so true. If you don't pay well, people will leave. And I want to go now and talk about your book because this is so exciting. It's your first book yes. and it's pre-launch and it yes. has a wonderful name, which I don't know how to pronounce as nice <laughs> as, you, as you are, Latina Madrina. Please say that because you yes. say it so beautifully. Latin Thank you. Yes, it's called Latina Madrina, uh, Stories, Lessons, and Hard Truths from a Brown Latina in Tech. So I'm I'm really excited about the launch of the book, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So first of all, I want to ask you about just what inspired you to write it. Yeah, so, you know, when you think about... Um, when I think about my career, uh, I, I it came out of really gratitude. Uh, I am very grateful. I, I feel very privileged in the position that I'm in. We mentioned that, you know, Latinas are a fraction of a fraction. Leaders, Latina leaders, like there's not, you know, it's a, it's a very small percentage. So the fact that I achieved that is, um, I'm just very um, grateful proud of myself, right? And I want to share. I want to share some of the lessons. I want to share some of the stories with other Latina leaders because there's not enough stories because there's not enough of us. So I think we all have a story. We we all have a book in us, right? To share about our experiences. And I want some kind of roadmap, right? Stories, lessons so that others know they're not alone. They're not alone in this journey. So I'm still learning, right? Because I'm still in, you know, life, living life and, and a career. Um, and so I want to be able to, to provide that kind of roadmap so that we can get even more Latinas in leadership roles and ensure that they're not feeling alone in their career and their journey because they don't have to, you don't have to. So I felt very much alone for, for a lot of my career I don't want that for others, right? So there's things that we can do that can solve for that. Perfect. And this is wonderful. And I want to get our listeners sneak peek and going to talk about two chapters. So let's start with the chapter 
about money and generational wealth. So can yes. you share a little bit about this chapter? Yes, I do a deep dive into this chapter about money and generational wealth. It is the longest chapter in the book. One of the main things that I talk about is what are some of the things that we've been told about money as Latinos? What have we been told about money? What are your what is your money mindset, right? So what is the story behind behind money? And then the language of money. Like we've got to really understand the language of money and be learners of money. So I talk it about, you know, investments. I talk about, you know, real estate. I talk about, you know, entrepreneurship and solopreneurship. So there's a lot there. And um, I even give some examples of, you know, what I did. You know, I certainly, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just sharing what's worked for me as well as what I'm learning from other people and who, you know, who's influencing me. So we do a deep dive into into money and building generational wealth. The one thing I'll share about generational wealth is, you know, Latinos are the demographic. They, they only, only a fraction of Latinos have generational wealth. And generational wealth, just to define it, right, just so that we're clear, is money that you're passing on to the next generation and the next generation after that about 2% of Latinos are able to build generational wealth and lead generational wealth for, for their families. So I think it's critically important that we think about that and look at ways that we can build generational wealth for, for our families. I mean, you know, we, we care about our families and providing for our families. So, um, so I think that's, yeah, that's one of the chapters. Uh, I think just for the chapter alone, you know, worth, <laughs> worth uh, you know, reading the book because this is so yeah. important. And I would say it's important not just for Latinas. I haven't read it yet because obviously it's pre-launch, but I'm sure it's important for so many people and especially women. I would agree. I think we don't talk about money enough. I keep saying it because it's true. We just don't talk about it enough. Um, and there are reasons behind that. And I just think it's important to talk about it. It's a tool. It's a resource. It's not bad. Right. You know, I'm a woman of faith. I'm a Christian and it's okay to talk about it. It's actually important to talk about it. Yeah. I think that the whole uh, relationship with money is something that I recommend everyone to work on and, and kind of change the wiring in your brain and yeah. see money Money is a good thing. Money yeah. that brings you and your family the kind of life that you want. Yes. Uh, and I I love money because it allows you to give back to community yeah. that you believe in. It, it brings so much goodness to it the does. world. It does. Exactly. It brings so much goodness. Um, money's gotten a bad rap, <laughs> for sure. Yes, for sure. It brings so much goodness. I, I agree. I agree with you. And uh, there was another chapter that I wanted just to touch on. You talk about cultural generational trauma and career. Can you share just a little bit about yeah, this chapter? Yeah, that that chapter also does a deep dive on things to consider in terms of our mindset. And we've been talking about it this like whole yeah. time. What are some of the things that we grown up with that we don't even realize that are impacting the way that we're managing our careers. So I talk a lot about, about that as well. I think that's really important to sort of really understand what's going on on the inside, right? What's really, what are the messages and the lessons that we've been telling ourselves and that we've grown up with um, on the inside? So, and how that impacts our career and what and it, how it doesn't serve us. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. And I just want to mention that the book is pre-launched and we are going to share the link in the show notes so everyone can go and oh, buy it. Yes, very excited. Very excited. This is so exciting. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Julissa, is there 
Anything else that you would like to share with our audience today, something that maybe I forgot to ask you or you think is really important that you want to highlight? Yes. You know, I talk about hard truths in the book, but I think it's also really important to talk about enjoying your career and the journey. There, you know, like this stuff is hard stuff, you know, like looking at generational trauma and money, but there's also ensuring that you have joy in your career. Like I, I just believe strongly in that, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of leader that I get things done through others and through relationships and influence. Right. And so I, just because we're talking about these hard things, doesn't mean that we cannot experience fun, joy in our careers as well. And whatever path that may take as a Latina leader or as a, as a leader, right? So I just want to make sure that that's also clear, right? Enjoying the journey, having fun, because, you know, we're going to talk about hard stuff, but we also, I think it's important to talk about the joys in it as well. This is an incredible way to end this episode. Absolutely agree with you. We have to enjoy it because otherwise we just keep hustling all the time for the next big thing and we never, we never enjoy it. Exactly. Exactly. Let's enjoy it. Absolutely. Well, it's been such a pleasure having you here, Julissa. How can people find you? Yes. Yeah, so can in the um, link, we're going to have uh, the book there. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. Perfect. I'll put also your LinkedIn URL there. Thank you so much for being here today. This and congratulations. Great. Congratulations yeah, on your you. book. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And um, I just really appreciate the chat. Thanks. Me too.